Hey, what's up, folks? Pastor Rob here. I hope that you're having a fantastic day. As we continue in our God's Word for you today's series, looking at the tough questions that you have raised about the Christian faith and about what we believe as a church family, we're going to tackle a tough question that was actually raised because of an article that someone received. That article raises the question of whether or not the Bible actually does speak out against the same-sex attraction and lifestyle but the way the article is worded is it calls into question whether or not the bible teaches anything against homosexuality so we're going to unpack that today and dive in and see what does the scripture actually teach the question is whether or not the bible actually teaches against homosexuality the article strives to present its case by raising a couple of interesting questions and or by providing factual historical evidence to disprove the fact that the Bible does speak out against homosexuality. Instead, it argues that the Bible speaks out against a certain form of homosexual practices in which one person is domineering over another, um, kind of an am animalistic thing is what they say the Bible is speaking out against. Now, the first accusation that they bring against the scriptures is that the word homosexual did not appear in English translations until 1946, and that the word was invented by evangelical Christians to speak out against the homosexual lifestyle. Well, the problem is that's not completely historically accurate. Now, as we've been going through our apologetic study on Sunday morning, we've talked about the basis of a sound argument, a valid argument. We've talked about the fact that sometimes in a debate situation or when you're speaking with somebody about your faith and they have a difficult objection to the faith that you cannot answer, sometimes it is acceptable to conceive and give some ground. So for example, or sorry, not conceive, concede and give some ground. So for example, it is true that the word homosexual itself did not appear in English translation until about 1946. That is a true statement. However, the word homosexual was not invented by evangelical Christians in the 1940s and placed into the RSV with the hopes of speaking out against same-sex lifestyles. In fact, the word actually originates in 1892, which is, let me do math real quick, 54 years before the RSV was even a thing. Um, and that word itself was chosen for the specific purpose of to relay a particular style of sexual orientation. Homo meaning same, and then obviously sexual meaning uh, intercourse, desire, lust, uh, what, all, what all you want to cl climb into that. So the idea that that word didn't appear until English translations until 1946 is, is a valid statement. I, we can concede that. We can agree that that is, that is a thing. Um, however, the word was not created by evangelical Christians. It was actually created by a novelist in 1892 to describe a lifestyle. And that's another point we need to bring up. The word homosexual was not an identification back then. It was not that you identified as a homosexual. It wasn't part of who you were in terms of your personality or your inclinations or anything like that. The word homosexual was created to describe the act of two individuals of the same sexual gender having sexual relations to one another. So that, that's number one. The second thing that they bring up in the article is that the language in which the Bible was written, Greek and Hebrew, specifically they're going to talk about the Greek in the article, that the words that are there that are used to talk about homosexual relationships, arsokonotai and makoiai, reference a specific type of homosexual behavior. Specifically, it represents the, and prohibits the use of temple prostitutes or the, the sodomy of young, innocent boys is what they're going to argue for. There is a bit of a problem with that argumentation, though, in itself. Number one, and perhaps 
most predominantly, you cannot make that argument based upon the language of the Greek. Now, they will argue that in other Greek literature, those words are used in that form. The problem with that actually is that one of those words are sarkonoka. Oh, man, I'm really struggling with that today. And normally I don't have any trouble with that word. Uh, uh, Arsenokotai, I don't know why I'm struggling with it so much, is actually a compound word, and it's a compound word that means men and bed. So literally the word means men who bed. And then by adding markotai, men. So their entire argument is that 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 language and those wordings, what that then does is it means that the Apostle Paul is writing against men who force themselves on other men for sexual intercourse in the confines of some temple prostitution thing. The problem with that, number one, that word, that first word there, arsenokotai, does not exist in ancient Greek literature prior to 1 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul actually historically and grammatically coined that word. So while we can concede that the English word homosexual was, was not in English translations until 1946, because the word wasn't invented until 1892, the Apostle Paul coined this phrase to describe something he saw as a depraved behavior according to the scriptures. If the Apostle Paul coined the word, then the Apostle Paul is the one who must tell us what the word means. We cannot infer our own meaning upon the word. The word literally means males who bed other males in the way that the compound is made with the other Greek word. So, I want to give some credit to translations like the Christian Standard Bible, and there are others as well that do this, but I'm going to pull it up on the screen here, where you'll notice their main angst is against 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, where Paul says right down in here, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or, as the RSV says, or homosexuals. But notice what the CSB says here. Males who have sex with males, no thieves, no greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our, the Spirit of our God. So, right out of the gate, the Apostle Paul is not singling out one aspect of homosexuality in terms of males who either have sex with males in a or loving relationship or males who have sex with males in a forceful, domineering relationship. He's, he's, not, he's not clarifying that at all. He is specifically, in Greek, stating men, males who have sex with males. And here, so if we, if we go to... Let me try to go. I'm trying to get this to work here for me. So if you go here, you have... Malakoi, Arsenokotai, right down here at the bottom in the blue for you. Those are males who have sex with males. Down here, you can see that um, Malakoi has the, the reference of a effeminate homosexual, so this would be the one who receives. And then Arsenokotai, the word that Paul penned and coined, has the, the phrase of male homosexual or the one who who does the act of, I'm trying to keep this PG, uh, of entering there. We'll, we'll, use the, we'll use that word. We'll use that word. I'm trying to keep this PG here. Um, and so Paul right there, he, he's, he's talking about both categories, the one who is receiving and the one who is given. He is talking about both aspects of the relationship. He is not clarifying why they're doing it. He's talking about the act himself. Now, it's important to note that he's talking about the act. He's not talking about any any temptation or desire or um, inclination or anything like that. He's talking about the physical act 
That is an important thing to note. Well, they would probably propose back, well, Paul is, is, is uh, talking about, you know, temple worship and all this stuff. Paul's letter is written to Christians who are in Corinth. And it's Corinth. As far as churches go, yes, we would concede that Corinth was a very jacked up church. There are no, no doubts about that. But Paul's writing is specifically about how the church should conduct itself. If you back up in chapter 6, he's talking about if you have legal disputes. He's talking about, um, you know, all, if you have legal disputes, why be cheated? Instead, if you, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do this to brothers and sisters. And then he goes... You know, likewise, if you cheat a brother or sister, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he lists off a not exhaustive list, but a fairly decent sized list of people that will not enter the kingdom of God because of their enter the kingdom of God because of their sins. But then notice you get down to the tail end of verse eleven. He says, And some of you used to be like this. So he admits there used to be people there that were homosexuals, people that had sex, males who had sex with males. There were people there that were sexually immoral, fornicators. There were people there that were idolaters, adulterers, thieves, that were greedy, they were drunkards, they were verbally abusive, they were swindlers. He admits that there were people in the church in Corinth that were like this. But notice what he says. But you were washed, referring to baptism, you were sanctified, referring to the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul's like, you used to be this way, but you're not now. Don't go back to it. Now, they would push down a little bit further and go, but everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I have will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will away with both of them. However, the body is not. Notice they, li they'll, they like to stop at this part. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So Paul, Paul anticipates that when he says, you know, yes, we have freedom in Christ. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. He's anticipating well, somebody's going to go, see, right there, you say it's okay. And Paul's like, but sexual immorality is not for the body, because the body is for the Lord. So that's going to nip that argument right in the butt as well. Now, they try to push back on Leviticus as well, uh, the passages in Leviticus that deal with sexual immorality uh, and homosexuality. And I think the reason why they do that is because the uh, passages in Leviticus themselves are in two different languages. You can find the... the he, original Hebrew translate, or not, well, not the original manuscripts, but the, the, the original Hebrew language. And you can also find the, um, find the uh, Greek Septuagint as well. During Jesus' day and during the time of the apostles, the predominantly tra predominant translation of the Old Testament was, in fact, the Greek Septuagint. But um, no, they'll go here, they'll go to uh, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13 to following. And they'll say that, well, you know, these are these are dealing with temple practices and all this stuff. And let me just let me just read this to you. You tell me if this sounds like to you temple practices. Uh, so, verse twenty, chapter twenty begins. The Lord spoke to Moses, say to the Israelites, any Israelite or alien residing in Israel who gives any of its children to Molech, so that's that is a temple practice must be put to death. The people of the country are to stone him. I will turn against that man and cut him off from this people because he has gave his offspring to Molech, defiling the sanctuary and profaning my holy name. But if the people of the country look the other way when that man gives any of his children to Molech and do not put him to death, then I will turn against that man and his family and cut them off from their people, both him and all who follow him and prostitute themselves with Molech. Whoever turns the mediums or spiritualists or prostitutes himself with them, I will turn against that person and cut them off from his people. Consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes to do them. I am the Lord who sets you apart. Now, before we dive into the next part, let me clarify something very important here in this Leviticus 20 passage. Chapter 20, remember chapter numbers and verse numbers were not in the original manuscripts, but chapter 20 begins with God specifically talking about the worship of Molech because they are getting ready to go into the land of the Canaanites where Molech worship is common. 
And he tells them, do not consort with mediums, do not consort with spiritualists, do not prostitute yourself with them, do not seek after foreign gods, because I will cut you off from your people, and I will cut you off from the land I'm giving you. Then in verse 7, then in verse 7, God says, consecrate yourselves and be holy. For I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord who set you apart. So now God, after dealing with the Moloch worship, is going to turn his attention to being holy. And he's going to specifically list out commands about sexual purity that will set them apart from the nations around them. Yes, in the context, he was just speaking about temple worship. But he is now going to widen that up to sexual purity as a whole. This happens a couple of times in Leviticus because these were common practices in the lands of the Canaanites. Verse 9, if anyone curses his father or mother, he must be put to death. He has cursed his father or mother. His death is his own fault. So that doesn't seem like temple practice. That seems like a code. So children, uh, Old Testament law, praise Jesus, we're in the New Testament because Old Testament law, you'd have been put to death. For cursing your mother or your father. Now, there's a specific context of what is meant by cursing, but just FYI. Verse 10. If a man commits adultery with a married woman, if he commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. If a man sleeps with his father's wife, he has violated the intimacy that belongs to his father. Both of them must be put to death. Their death is their own fault. If a man sleeps with his daughter-in-law, both of them must be put to death. They have acted perversely. Their death is their own fault. If a man sleeps with a man as with a woman, they have both committed a detestable act, and they must be put to death. Their death is their own fault. If a man marries a woman and her mother, he is depraved. Both he and they must be burned, so that there will be no depravity among you. If a man has sexual intercourse with an animal, he must be put to death. You are also to kill the animal. If a woman approaches any animal and mates with it, you are to kill the woman and the animal. They must be put to death. Their death is their own fault. If a man marries his sister, whether his father's daughter or his mother's daughter, and they have sexual relations, is a disgrace. They are to be cut off publicly from their people. As he has had sexual intercourse with his sister, he will bear his iniquity. If a man sleeps with a menstruating woman and has sexual intercourse with her, he has exposed the source of her flow, and she has uncovered the source of her blood. Both of them are to be cut off from their people. You must not have sexual intercourse with your mother's sister or your father's sister, for it is exposing one's own blood relative. Both people will bear their iniquity. If a man sleeps with his aunt, he has violated intimacy belonging to his uncle. They will bear their guilt and die childless. If a man marries his brother's wife, it is impurity. He has violated the intimacy that belongs to his brother. They will be childless. So as you can see there, there's a lot going on in that passage. But what it is, is it is the idea of remaining sexually pure. This is not a new concept. All of the Old Testament has laws regarding sexual purity. And a lot of times where we see people in the Old Testament punished, it is because of their lack of sexual purity. But the one thing I want to point out to you is they try to make this talk about temple worship or say that it's not talking about uh, homosexuals, but rather men that force themselves upon other men. Again, I'm trying to get the language to cooperate here. But if you look here, if you look here, the Hebrew does not allow for that. The word, the word there, um, in Hebrew, for now, one one could argue, the the word there could be translated person, um, but Hebrew uses the masculine often for male and people groups as well. But my point here is that the word in Hebrew here literally means, as you can see here on your thing, the words right here, to lie down, to lie, to sleep with, to lie sick, are all possible the syntaxes. But its root word means to mate, to mate, to lie with, to mount, to have intercourse. There's no getting around the fact that what the writer of Leviticus, which is Moses, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is writing down as commands to the people of Israel, is that a man is not to sleep with a man as he does with a woman. And notice there, 
According to the Leviticus, it is considered a detestable act. It is something that God very much looks down upon with disgust. Now, we're not talking the people. Please, please, please understand me on this. God loves the person. Without question, God loves the person. So if you are someone who is trapped in the homosexual relationship, if you are someone who is trapped in the homosexual lifestyle, let me as a minister of the gospel, let me as a pastor tell you that God loves you. God wants to redeem you out of that. God wants to save you out of that transgression, out of that trespass. Yes, to him, the act is detestable. Yes, to him, the act is sin. But God can rescue you. God can save you. God can redeem you. He loves you. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on your behalf. You do not have to remain in that sin any longer. Now, someone might push back as we try to wrap this down to a a close someone might push back and someone might say as the article does and as i heard said before that well the bible is condemning these 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 forceful sexual relationships of men forcing themselves upon other men (laughs) because that was the culture back then we don't have the same loving same-sex relationships that we do now back then. That is a very flawed, logical argument. It's assuming that just because we have something now, it wasn't present back then. Likewise, just because there are historical records of these things taking place does not mean that they were condoned by God. There are a lot of things that are found in Scripture as examples of what not to do. There are a lot of things historically that remind us of things that we should not do. To say that, well, they're just writing against forceful sexual relationships because we didn't, they didn't have the same loving and same-sex relationships that we have now, back then, it's a non-sequitur. It doesn't follow. It's a very failed attempt at a logical argument. Um, the Bible is very, very clear, and this video may not stay up very long, and that's that is what it is. But the Bible is very clear. It is a sin. But it is not a sin that has to keep you snared. There is hope found in Jesus Christ. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Facebook um, or call the church, and you'll be directed to my cell phone know that you are loved and we would love for you to join us at cedar grove christian church as we we preach the truth of the scriptures but we love you just as you are we love you for who you are but we strive very hard to lead you to jesus christ because he won't leave you where you are church and those watching that's all i have for you god bless have a great day